welcome to another season of football with Southampton Football Club and of course the Saints FC podcast. Welcome back everyone. Thanks John. Hi, welcome back. Um, so for those of you who are new to the show, you're not going to know um, who we all are. So uh, we'll quickly introduce ourselves. So uh, my name is John Bailey. I'm the, I suppose, the host of the Saints FC podcast. Um, sat to my left hand side. Hi, I'm Tom. Uh, Tom Parker. I regularly have the fortune to sit on the sofa with John and talk about Saints. Hi, I'm James Bailey, and I, uh, I'm fortunate enough to slightly less regularly talk about Southampton as well. Yeah. But regularly sleep on this sofa. <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're, I mean, we're all three Saints fans. Uh, for those of you that um, have listened before, we're not going to go too far into the details. Um, but obviously, you know, big welcome to everyone who's listening for the first time. Uh, big w- welcome back to everyone who listened to us last season and the season before. Um, as you know, if you want to get in contact with us on Twitter, you can do at Saints FC podcast if you want to email in. You can do so at saintsfcpodcast at gmail.com. We're going to be going through some of your questions and statements and thoughts on, on the new season a little bit later on in the show. Um, but if you want to hear what we think about what, what you have to say, do get in, involved in those channels. Um, if you want to tell your friends, particularly the Saints supporting friends about this podcast, that would be really useful. Lots of people don't know how to download podcasts. Um, but you can show that person how to do it. You can even show them how to access it on YouTube. Tell a friend about it, tweet about it, write can, to your MP about it. I don't know. You can even just take their phone off them, type Saints FC podcast into their podcast app and hit subscribe. Yeah, but you do have to show them how to get back to that and then uh, and actually <laughs> listen to it afterwards. Um, okay, so, I mean, should we, should we crack on with the agenda? Yes, why not? Yeah, so, I mean, we had last season. Should we have a, a, a word on the World Cup? Uh, bittersweet. Bittersweet, yeah. We're all England fans here. It, I mean, I don't think any any of us necessarily expected reaching the semi-finals. A bit disappointing not to have any Saints players in it, but that, that disappointment seemed kind of evaporated with the excitement, didn't it? Would have been nice to see Ryan Bertrand's. It would have yeah, been nice to see Ryan Bertrand. Yeah, perhaps in probably the only one. Yeah. Probably the only one who could have made it. Um, there were some other Saints players playing in the World Cup, though, and um, we might be talking about a couple of those later on. Um, last season, uh, we sat down on the sofa and we talked about our predictions for this season. And um, we'd just come off the back of the season with Claude Puel, managed to get Saints to eighth in the um, Premier League, got us to the EFL Cup final. But the football was pretty turgid. We hadn't scored for, you know, hadn't scored particularly frequently in the last kind of, I suppose, dozen games of the season, really. And it was starting to get pretty dark. And we chatted about it. No one was particularly disappointed that Claude Puel had left. And, and we were looking quite forward and with quite a lot of excitement to what life might be under, like under Maurizio Pellegrino. And we, we just thought, well, if he can achieve what Claude Puel did, but then do it with a bit more panache, a bit more excitement, a bit more personality, then we'd be looking forward to the season. And we kind of predicted that was what was going to happen. How did that work out, John? Uh, it didn't really work out. <laughs> he didn't even see the season out, Mar- Maurizio Pellegrini. Thank God for that. Yeah. yeah. I, I think if he had seen the season out, we might be talking about life in the championship. Yeah, we'd have a game on Saturday. Hmm. So if, if he had. Uh, we do have a game, but it's one of those meaningless pre-season ones, isn't it? Unless we win, in which case it's a sign that we're definitely going to win the league. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> um, so, I mean, we... We had kind of two previous seasons where we started off with a brand new manager. And this season is a little bit different in the fact that Mark Hughes kind of started a little bit early with a rescue job. Um, but I think we can talk about him in the same sort of terms as being a new manager. So, I mean, Mark Hughes, he's been in the Premier League since 2004 with Blackburn. Previous to that, he was Wales manager. And obviously, those of us who are old enough to remember him scoring lots of goals in the Premier League, playing for Southampton, in fact, where he didn't score many goals, but did score an amazing volley. That was a great goal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, what, what are your thoughts on the new-ish manager? Uh, well, he's got to be now, what, is with Wenger gone? Is he the most... Uh, the manager with the most Premier League experience, maybe. Um, 
I'm ex- I like Mark Hughes a lot. I think he is capable of doing the simple things. I, I think we have to be realistic. He's not going to probably get us into the Champions League. Uh, but can he, uh, you know, based on the evidence, can he motivate the players Southampton have to perform at least the level that they are capable of? I think we saw that towards the end of last season. Um, you know, I like. I think he's, he seems pretty honest. And I think with the signings the, the club have made, they've backed him, which is really important. You know, previous seasons, we've gone into the first game almost signing players too late and it doesn't look like they've trained or... Yeah, I think this time around, we, he's the club have given him a really good chance. So I'm I'm excited about about the next season coming up. Yeah, and I suppose that whole thing about kind of signing people late or early is Mark Hughes being appointed a little bit before the end of last season meant that he was already in place all summer, which probably helped with that. Yeah, and it also means we've been able to get rid of the deadwood in the squad, and obviously mm-hmm. people. Uh, some of those are players which, um, you know, if you believe what you read, are considered to be quite negative influences around the club. Um, so hopefully. Uh, you know, and we also appear to have kept, um, you know, every player that you'd probably want to keep, mm. particularly the two fullbacks. Um, so, all in all, touch wood, lack of a striker aside, it's looking like a pretty successful preseason. James, what what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think um, I'm I'm quite happy with Mark Hughes. Um, I know I did say at the end of last season that maybe we should look at other managers, but um, a bit of that was devil's ab- advocate, and a, a little bit of that was. Maybe we could have got someone better, but I think we've got him, and I'm I'm perfectly happy with him. And let's, and we've still got most of our good players, and we've got some new ones as well. So yeah, hopefully, um, we'll um we'll hit this season running and um and get get back to where we should be in the table. So um, I don't know if you guys would be interested in listening to the win percentages of Mark Hughes and his his previous tenures. So um. I think we can rule out Wales because I don't think there's too much similarity with that one. But with Blackburn Rovers, he was there for four years, win percentage of 43.6. You take that, wouldn't you? I mean, when he was appointed as Blackburn manager, the mission statement was to avoid relegation. Mm. And he got them, I think, to a cup final or cup semi final in that tenure as well. Manchester City, slightly higher expectation. Um, He was there for about a year and a half with a win ratio of 46. Percent again, pretty good, but probably not up to the standards that Man City expected at that point. So that was, he was there when all the money came flooded in, didn't? He? Yeah, he didn't last, did he? That that long. And then we've got a bit of um, a dip here. So then he was manager at Fulham for uh, basically a season with a thirty-two percent win ratio, and Queens Park Rangers the following season. Um, well, he did kind of half as two halves of a season, and things didn't go so well there. So I think he they survived relegation the first half that he kind of came in for, and then the second half of the next season things were not looking particularly good, and he got the boot. Keep a bit of a poison chalice, though, isn't it? Yeah. And then Stoke City, who I think probably is maybe the closest in terms of kind of like size, fan base, financial backing. Um, yeah, he he played. He was manager of two hundred games there, which is about five years, um, and a thirty-five and a half percent win ratio. It's not bad. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's it's right. If a Stoke, I mean, sorry, Stoke fans, but you know they've, they've yeah, struggled to attack the great place. Place. no and if you are listening yeah. to it you're in the wrong place <laughs> wrong 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 stripes yeah uh, no i don't think i don't think we've got anything really to worry about with mark Hughes. he he knows the league i think one of the main things we grumbled about last season consistently under pellegrino was his in-game management and he would just be outwitted by seemingly the most obvious things and you do get the impression mark he that's going to probably not happen to mark Hughes so much yeah if we compare him to some recent Saints managers and like win percentage, so let's let's say thirty five percent might be what we'd expect. Maurizio Pellegrini, twenty three percent is win win that, percentage. I think that was even worse yeah. when you look at Premier League. Clubwell, thirty seven percent. Which, you know, solid. Solid but underwhelming, I think. Is. Yeah. <laughs> How many of those were 1 0? 1 0 victories. That's on the top of Claudewell's CV. Claudewell, solid but underwhelming. Um, Kuman, 48.35%. <sighs> I 
I watched that video of the three two against yeah. Liverpool the other day, and it does make your heart flutter. Um, Pochettino, thirty eight percent. Nigel Atkins, fifty four percent. I mean, I suppose it's a slightly different era Southampton that really is. Um, Alan Pardew is one fifty three percent win win ratio. Again, down in League One though, where we were expected to win games. Uh, yeah, uh, but what a great time that was as a Saves fan. Yeah, fantastic. So, so what do we think he's going to do? Uh, or or, or sh- should we just mull over that? Should we get through the podcast and then you can give you some predictions at the end? Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Let's get warmed up. Let, let's get warmed up. Okay. Right, come on. Let, let's get excited about this. So we've got a new manager in. We've got some new players in. Um, we've got someone with a lot of experience. We've got someone who's British, which is, means a lot for a lot of people. Certainly probably means an improvement in terms of communication. I think yeah. Pellegrini yeah. even identified that himself as, as something that he had a problem with. Um so let, let's get into our first kind of listener tweet from Saints in France, Robbie. Um, and he just says, your opinions on the transfer business so far. So, I mean, I don't know. Basically, you can get, you can jump in, shout a player and then tell me what you think. Gutted about Stuart Taylor. Okay. Explain why. I don't just know. Just for the social just, media Just because I thought it was a funny thing to say, John. Okay. <laughs> I hope you're all chuckling wherever you are listening to this. James, give me a shout. I mean, the the player I'm going to miss is Tadic, because even when he wasn't bothering to put much effort in, he still managed to get in, get in the odd assist and the odd goal. And when he was playing well, he was really good. So that's going to be annoying that yeah. he's gone. But I'm going to ask you both your biggest, best Tadic memory. A little bit. Oh, so I know mine. That oh, I know mine. It's good. Um, okay. What about, let's, should we go through our out? Let's get let's get rid of the deadwood first, and then let's yeah. get excited about the players coming. Sofia and Buffal out on loan to Celta Vigo. What a wasted talent! You know, and I we all dreamt as kids, didn't we? All being footballers, and and you know, it was like the dream thing to do, and we all had this pipe dream that even though everyone knew that by the age of six who was going to who could ever be a footballer. And Buffon has all that talent, all that skill, all that brilliance, and he he just can't apply it. Certainly in this league, um, like it's sad to see him go. But how many more chances were they going to give him? And I think that that the persistent rumours of you know him offering to fight Mark Hughes or Mark Hughes offering to fight him, basically trying to start a fight with Pellegrino after he scored that one deal. Yeah, you just you know he's got a bad attitude and and good riddance to bad rubbish, I say, but. You know, and if you look like how many goals, five goals in two seasons, um, you know, yeah. one goal that really mattered, which was the, the West Brom goal. Yeah. It's not really a great return. Goals in that, but. Yeah, but also there were some lovely touches, but there wasn't, yeah. he didn't hurt teams, did he? No, there was a lot of frustration basically involved in watching him. Um, okay, next one out, Guido Carrillo. Well, that's the... So he's, you know, Everton's record signing. Yeah, I mean, as far as we know, Southampton's biggest waste of money as well so far. I mean, maybe he'll come back um, and show us, prove us all wrong in a year's time. But given that he's gone to um, the team that finished seventeenth in, yeah, Leganes, who's finished seventeenth in the last three seasons in La Liga, and followed Mauricio Pellegrino. Yeah back followed him i think we i think we can guess who wanted to sign him and um and i don't yeah and he didn't really do it for us on the pitch you know? it's so weird isn't it like the club we spoke about this last season how the club is you know so intelligent mm-hmm. and the black box and thinks like light years ahead of anyone else and then they must have known that the stage was set for pellegrino and even if we stayed up Pellegrino would have probably had to go, mm. certainly based on the precedent they set with Claude Puel. So why sign this guy? This guy that you know, I, I don't doubt his effort and his commitment, but he couldn't get off the bench really for Monaco. He never looked like scoring a goal for Saints, um, and it just was such a weird signing. We spent all that money, and you know, I know I I do bang on about the young players a lot, but. How bad could Sam? How he could he could Sam? Would Sam Gallagher have been any worse? Bring Sam Gallagher back from loan from from Birmingham. 
Um, it was just such a weird signing that, you know, makes you think football is still, for all the science and everything it says, football is still mad. The, so I'm going to pick out the highlight of his uh, Saints career and let me know if you disagree with, with me on this. But on a bleak, cold 24th of February 2018, Southampton were trailing Burnley 1-0 from an Ashley Barnes goal. How familiar that sounds. And then in the 90th minute, I think, was it a corner? It went to the back post and Guido Carrillo headed it. Was it a head back? Goal right. And Gabbiadini. Netted, it yeah. 1-1. One, one. That's it. That's it, isn't yeah. it? It's 19 million pounds, right? Pounds. I feel, I, I've got to say, I feel sorry for the guy because Sage should never have signed him. Um, he clearly wasn't cut out for it. I, I feel, you know, as much as you can feel sorry for any 25 year old earning 60 grand a week, I feel sorry for the guy. We last This time last season, we talked about um, what was it that Cuco Martina had on Kuman, the fact that he'd signed him for Everton. Um, I mean, I think Guido Carrillo has obviously achieved a lot more in his career than. Cuco Martina has. He did quite well at Monaco a couple of seasons ago. But I think, you know, for Saints, he's another Martina, except without a wonderful goal to remember him by. He's the, and I say, he's the answer to a pub quiz yeah. question, in, isn't he? In fact, actually, normally, our big signings, even the flops, at least get a really important or special goal. I mean, Danny Pablo Osvaldo. Was Osvaldo, yeah. City. Buffal, who's a previous record signing, that goal against West Brom. Yeah. Rory Delap. <laughs> yeah, he was yeah, a record. He scored a few. Yeah, he scored it's about, true. He scored a few goals sometimes. He, he was actually a fairly decent signing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jordi Classy back to Feyenoord. My views is Jordi Classy stood in the way of Harrison Reed, mm. and he was a again. He was a strange signing. Didn't look big or strong enough for that league. Um, and the best win per, per yeah. of any Saints player. He's Thanks. Over fifty games. Thanks, Duncan Alexander. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, just didn't look big enough. Didn't look strong enough. Um, just totally unsuited and you just did wonder like that was a, a Kuman signing to be fair Kuman got a lot, a lot right in his yeah. signings uh, he, that one was wrong I mean it was wrong but it wasn't it wasn't a disaster um, Florian Gardos who according to my sources is signed for a team called Unassigned Players or I think that means <laughs> he hasn't even got a club apparently he was on like 35 grand a week at Saints really I think he's gone to a university from what I saw. I know, I think, Romania or Croatia, I think a lot of the Romanian teams have like university before okay. them, like university Craiova. Yeah. Um, so I, I think they're like professional teams, but um, but yeah, never really got yeah. a chance to show anything, and then did he? two that we've already mentioned, Dusan Tadic and Stuart Taylor. I'm going to bring, bring us back to Tadic in a little bit. Um, so let's get on to the end. So, like I say, this is the bit where I want you guys to get me excited. Um, what do we know about Stuart Armstrong? £7 million from the Scottish champions. Apparently he has a marvellous hairdo. That's, that's all I know. Can you he tell me is, the rest? He is very handsome. Could, looks like he could have been on Love Island a few years ago. By all accounts, he's going to give us a bit of craft in midfield. He scores goals. It's difficult, isn't it, to gauge with the Scottish league. Um, but everyone who's played with him speaks very, very highly of him. Um, uh Brendan, Brendan Rogers, who obviously managed Liverpool and Swansea, knows the Premier League, spoke very, very, very highly of him, saying he's a player who can play at the highest level. He looks like he hurts play, uh, hurts teams. So, um, yeah, I, and we know Saints have been after him for quite some time. So, and we, you know, we have missed a midfield schemer, haven't mm. we? And he does, you know, he's been playing behind the front two at the preseason. So think, it'd be interesting. Yeah, Stephen Davis got older and been more injured. That that kind of midfield schemer, mm. you know, that person who can do the box to box role in quite a clever way yeah is that who he's been brought in as understudy and potential replacement of yeah I think so I think um, we always seem to send, have a scout permanently parked at Celtic Park watching their players mm. and bringing in the best ones so I've got to assume that he's, he must be one of the best ones up there he scores a few goals gets a few assists probably has quite good distribution in the in the um the opponent's half, which is something we really do need and we were lacking last season. And um, he has the odd shot from outside the box, which is another thing we, we didn't really do last season as well. So, yeah, hopefully he should uh, he should produce some good uh, good yeah. form for us and get some goals, get some assists, put in some good performances. And so the hair, 
It's just got really good hair. So, I mean, what, what can you describe why it's so good? Because, I mean, basically... It's so luxurious. I mean, like, looking at my hair, right, it's, it's okay, like, one-dimensional hair. But this is... It's like Jack from Love Island hair. It's so thick. It's like Samson. So um, I have no idea who Jack from Love Island is. He's got really good hair, like very thick hair. But I'm just saying he's got, you know, he looks a bit um, like Roy the Rover style. I've got a feeling he's going to be, a, there's a few fan favourites this year. I've got yeah. a feeling Stuart Armstrong is going to be a big fan favourite. Do you think? Yeah. I just, I think he's going he's gonna to bring something to the team and relax. Just a bit of spark, a bit of imagination. So, I mean, in terms of goals, his career total is 48 from 291 appearances. It's so one in that chipping in once every six. One games. every six, yeah. That would be all right, wouldn't it? If that's it really good, like that, yeah. In the Premier League, I mean that's a that's a seven games, seven goal season, which uh, of any of our midfielders, apart from Tadic, got seven goals in a season recently. And Tadic is arguably a, a forward well, slash winger. Yeah. yeah. So like you know, if he if he does that, then yeah. he's done exceptionally well. Okay, so Stuart Armstrong, we're looking forward to meeting you. Mohamed Elionusi. I have no idea if I've got that pronunciation right, but it looks, if that's how it's phonetically, then I, I, that might be a good fist there. I mean, how would you enough. say it, Tom? I, you don't even want to begin. To, no, so <laughs> I'll just call him L. Ellie. Ellie, yeah. I, no, I mean, oh, Ellie. this yeah. is your guy. You're, you're a big fan. Yeah, I, um, when he signed him, he, um, I sort of was like, I think I've heard of him. And then... Uh, <laughs> which always helps and um yeah so you know did the classic thing go to youtube type in the name get the auto um correct spelling of the name from youtube and um and looked at the videos um he put in a pretty good performance against man city at the etihad last season in the champions league scored a goal yeah he did didn't he and um and yeah he's 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 an assists and goals man so we we like people that get us goals and um and i think he's he's gonna do a good job good attacking player nice pass on him likes a good little dink over the top something for other players to run on to so if you're going to describe him to a saints fan are there any kind of players or ex-players that you would look at and say he looks a bit like he could be one of them i mean i'd probably say tadic okay and um maybe tadic like you know I think the problem with Tadic last season is that he's been in the Premier League for a while, so people, I think people work work them out, like mm. at least some players do. And so I think a fresh, tricky attacking midfielder is always a good thing because it keeps the opponents on their toes. And usually um, they don't actually bother to look at them until uh, until we've played them once and he's scored a goal or got the assist. So, so Tom, I'm going to need your maths here. 236 career appearances, 80 goals. What's that? One in every five? One in, one in three. One in three? Yeah. 240, the closest. Yeah, right. um, now that would be something, wouldn't it? Yeah. That would be great. I mean, obviously, looking at the standard of football he's played at, um, you know, he's played in for two Norwegian clubs and then Basel. But, uh, yeah, he's played Champions League regularly. He's got goals in the Champions League. Um, Saints have, by all accounts, been tracking him for something like six years, he said in an interview recently. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I think we've got... I think this is a really exciting signing for Saints. This is a genuine Champions League footballer of the kind of player that... like A bit like Lamina, you know, a kind of Champions League player that is willing, you know, with the money that's in the Premier League now and the attention the Premier League gets, is willing to take a sort of a, a small step down and sideways almost. Yeah. Um, and it, it does seem to be a genuine winger with pace that's very direct, which is, and then and with end product, yeah. And we've kind of had pace, we've had direct, we've suffered for end product probably since Mane. Mm. Um, so yeah, exciting times, big signing. Yeah, turns twenty four this week. Happy birthday, Morocco Mohammed. Origin, but uh, plays for Norway, and um, he's even got four international senior international goals, which is quite exciting, including a hat trick against. The formidable force of San Marino. Hey, they're no mugs. Yeah. He has also got a, go- a goal against Sweden, which, you know, they're a little bit meaner in defence than San Marino. Um, uh, you know, and someone who scores against Man City, he'd be very welcome to do that again next season. So moving next down onto my list, Angus Gunn, a goalkeeper. And I think this is a transfer which, I mean, it caught me by surprise. Yeah. 
this is good because this is one of our two combined transfers uh, with a combined height of something like 13 and a half foot, uh, which I like. Uh, it's sort of size of a family caravan. Do you know the entire height of our transfers? <laughs> I just care about the two big ones. Yeah. Now, again, this kind of took everyone by surprise. I think it's a real sign that if you're Fraser Forster, you must be thinking, that's it, I'm kind of done. You're kind it's of gone. thinking, where can I get a loan to? In the yeah, league? you know, England's number two slash number three to Southampton's number three. And as you pointed out, we don't have great goalkeepers. Mm. So to be third choice at Saints is not a very flattering position to be in. Uh, all I know really about him is that apparently Norwich fans rated him very highly. He's very, very good. Um, son of Brian Gunn. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a, a literal biblical giant. Um and I think it's good because I think one of the real problems we have with yeah, Fraser Forster. He's not a literal biblical He's not, yeah. Wow, well, he could That's be. A, he's a metaphorical he's a, yeah. giant, oh, so. probably in the flatlands of Norwich. Yeah, in, yeah. The, in the fens. <laughs> yes. You'd see it from miles away. Uh, I think he's, what's good as well, I think one of the problems with Fraser Forster is I think Fraser Forster for, got complacent, he seemed to get complacent. Yeah. Uh, he took the foot off his gas and uh, you know because McCarthy could not get near that team no matter what and then turns out McCarthy was actually pretty good when he came mm. in it's good I think you know they need to be kept on their toes so where does Angus Gunn come in the pecking order is he in below McCarthy or has he jumped straight to the top I think he's numero deux numero deux yeah same I mean here. I'm saying that as, as though, like Fraser Forster's you know are we considering Fraser Forster's on his way out? I think Fraser Forster's gone to Rainbow Bridge. He's he's out. Yeah. I mean, there are rumours that he's going to go to Burnley. And Burnley have great track record with goalkeepers, don't they? Is it Tom Heaton and Nick Pope? Are there two goalkeepers? Is Heaton Burnley or am I getting... Yeah, he is. Right? But yeah. Pope Pope's injured, I think. So if he goes to Burnley... Mm. I mean, they, is he going there as an understudy? To I Heaton? think he's going Heaton to. He's also injured, which is why Pope got his opportunity. Yeah, I think he'll be going as an understudy to Heaton. Yeah, and Heaton's a very good keeper. Yeah, I, I, I also think that other clubs probably look at Fraser Foster from a couple of seasons ago, or three seasons ago, or four seasons ago, where he actually was a very good goalkeeper for us, and he does, he is massive, and he does save a penalty quite regularly. Yeah. And so I do think he's good enough to go into another, like another team in the Premier League, mm. and give it a go. And it's, I think he's just lost a bit of, it's lost a bit of focus. And you, you know, with some players, it might just be a change of scenery or a new manager that gets them on their toes, that um, you know, a new challenge that will bring them back. And I think maybe that maybe a loan at another club could could reignite his career, and he might come back to us uh, uh- better. And what about Angus Gunn? What t- type of goalkeeper is he? Because um, if he's young, he's a hot prospect, he's highly rated, why is Pep not interested in him? Because Pep likes young, rated players and quite often moulds them in his own shape. But we also know that Pep with goalkeepers likes goalkeepers to be, you know, your 11th outfield player. Is, is that going to be where he's going to be lacking? Is that why he's not been given a chance with Pep? I don't know. I mean, Man City are, they're a footballing for not, you know, they're a, mm. they're a behemoth. machine, aren't they? A behemoth. Yeah. And they're not got time for players that may or may not be mm. great. You know, they've, 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 they can't risk the game time with players like that, particularly obviously a goalkeeper where it can go so wrong so quickly. Um, and you know, maybe the alternative is that maybe they did want to keep him mm. and maybe he wanted to go. Um, you know, he must be realistic. He's not going to get near that number one shirt at Man City so you know maybe Man City's misfortune is our gain I hope very much that is the case yeah 22 years old I mean let's hope you know, if, if he turns out to be good he could have a you know, good solid 15 years ahead of him yeah which would be great especially if they're good solid 15 years for us mm. and like, like a nice long career plan and, and for he's us. played for England at every single level yeah so so Gary Southgate's going to be keen on him when he's yeah proved it in the Premier League and also, it was a nice under-the-radar signing. You don't get yeah. many of those anymore. Um, so next signing, which probably can't go under the radar because of the size of the guy. Yes. You know, this Viking has strode into St. Mary's. Uh, Yannick Vestergaard. Um, again, not entirely sure if I got the pronunciation right, but hopefully um, our Norwegian friends can get involved and tell us. Um, or Danish friends. Danish friends, yeah. That's, uh, Racist. I mean, obviously, I send Norwegian friends for uh, Mohamed Ali <laughs> and uh, our Danish friends for Yannick Vestergaard. Signed from Borussia 
Gladbeck? Yeah. For £18 million. That's a serious outlay for Southampton. We don't normally pay that much for players, do we? Only players that score one or that we just ship off to Leganes. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, score none. Score none and ship off to Leganes, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I believe that Vestigard is, is Danish for cult hero. This guy has got cult hero written all over him. He's a giant. He's like something from Game of Thrones. Uh, he can head the ball, which is something actually we've not been able to do for since Van Dyke went off the boil. Um, he scores goals. Again, something our centre-backs haven't really done since Van Dyke went off the ball. He looks like a leader. A German colleague of mine who lives in Munich. Uh, sports Hamburg, so the Vestergaard is one of the best centre backs in in um, in the Bundesliga, and he's amazed that he's been allowed to go to Southampton um, because he thought he'd go somewhere, you know, one of the top German teams or one of the top Italian or, or teams. He strikes me as a really, really exciting player, and he seems like a really nice guy. So, so what's the catch? We're, we're just a stepping stone. Aren't we? This is maximum yeah, but... two seasons of a wonderful player. Everyone apart from Barcelona, Real Madrid. And PSG are a stepping stone. Yeah, there, there's no shame in being a stepping stone. Um, let's enjoy it. I mean, the catch is probably he's got the turning circle of a of an oil tanker. Yeah. So what? So, so it's. It, I mean, we've had some pretty seriously decent centre backs come through Southampton over the years. Do we think he's going to be the next one? Is he the next big star? Yeah, I hope so. And I think he also, it's one of these things where it looks like Mark Hughes looked at something that one of the, our failings, especially under Mark Hughes, uh, well, not especially un, under Mark Hughes, but for the whole season was our mm. inability to defend corners when Van Dyke left. And um, and buying a Could player that is end? a giant. Could this be the end of the last 10 minutes <laughs> back post? <laughs> And we were Cedric being left responsible, or, or is that just the five at the back? I mean, we were like, I think, I think Cedric's bad. always going to get caught out the back at some point because he's he just doesn't have that. I mean, so even he's, jumping, he's some players are taller than him. Yeah. Um, but I think it's more that the corners coming in and just defending crosses that this guy should help us with. I think he's he sounds like, by all accounts, he sounds like a decent player. He's Hot tip: He um he was one of the highest scoring fantasy football players for a defender in the Bundesliga last season. I I've got to admit I've already got I've already got him <laughs> in my fantasy football team. Tom's just shown me an Instagram photo of him standing about a foot taller than the shower head of some hotel. He's, he's he's in, he says the downside of being nearly two meters and showering in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> it's excellent. He's got a sense of humor as well. Yeah, rare in a footballer. Um, okay, so let, let, let's move on now. So Ashley, um, a good name, 177. That's his Twitter handle. If you'd like to follow him, said, any players that have moved to different clubs this summer that you wish we had signed? And whilst oh, that's you a good that, question. I can give you another question. Who would you like us to sign? Who have we not yet signed? Because the, the season is a mere week and a half mm. away. I'm going to, I mean, this might be controversial for some Southampton fans, and I think it'd be incredibly popular for others. Um, I think we should sign Adam Lallana. I mean, if I, want, if I wanted a player, I'd want someone who's going to sit behind the, um, the strikers, cause trouble, get assists, score goals, and has, has a nice, um, nice touch of the ball. You know, he likes to take it past players. I'd love to see him back. Hmm. I mean, I I am a, a little bit bitter about how he left, but I can I can you, quick you I could swiftly move on if he if he if it was just like shock transfer. Adam Lallana decides that Liverpool was a waste of his time and comes back to Southampton. I mean, it, that's, it's not really realistic, though, is it? I mean, Liverpool don't <sighs> have in the shop window, do they? Unless Naby Keita. No, I don't. They signed a few midfielders this yeah. year, but they play a lot of games, don't they? So I don't know. Who so, would I like us to sign? I, is that Sam Bokes? That's my guess. Yeah, well, Sam Bokes is on the list, isn't he? But do we need another massive, permanently cropped striker? Uh, I would suggest I mean, not. We could do the massive striker that is fit all the time and yeah. loves scoring goals for fun. And, you know, Someone Sam... Like Alan Shearer. Sam Bokes is a very good player on his day. Um, but, you know, I, you could see Sam Bokes getting very injured yeah. very quickly. I don't really think... I, I'm trying to think who we need. We need a full... I do think we need another goal-scoring forward. Yeah. Um 
do we go like a bit left field? Do we have like a Danny Welbeck? Uh, again, would be injured. I'm getting some shaking of the heads here. Yes, well, You're like a Daniel Sturridge, but that's someone who's a bit of a, a fox Daniel in the box. St- I mean, yeah, but Daniel Sturridge's performances Sturridge. for West Brom was, I think, wasn't it like 53 minutes against us where he was very threatening and then he limped off the pitch and wasn't mm, threatening yeah. for the rest of the season. I don't know. I don't think there's none of the. I'm looking here at the completed transfer list. There's, there's nothing that exciting. In terms yeah. of players that you think we've missed a trick on. Yeah, I don't know. It's difficult, isn't it, to, to feel where we'd really get a, a lift. Um, because I do think all we are really is is a few of our players playing above the level they've recently been playing at. Players like uh, Charlie Austin, players like Nathan Redmond. Uh, if they can play at the level we know they're capable of, um, then we'll be absolutely, we'll be more than fine. We'll be pretty strong. I actually think we've probably had one of the better transfer windows. I've had a lot of people looking enviously across to West Ham United. I mean, Jack Wilshere. I'm surprised we didn't go for Fedrix because uh, we need a right back clearly mm. um, and obviously a free transfer would have been a good one um, yeah I don't know I mean they've spent a lot of money as yeah. they always do um, it it'll be interesting them, it doesn't yeah. it very rarely works out for them to be honest so yeah Let, let's see let's see I think I don't think there's anyone I would have really you know, really kicking myself that we didn't sign. Um, I mean, last season for me, I thought Kelly Inacho was perhaps the the player that I thought yeah we should have brought in. I also called Harry Maguire. I was big. I'd like. I would have liked to yeah. sign Harry Maguire. Yeah, um, he's proven his worth, really, hasn't he? Uh, but you know, you can't look back. You can only look forward. And you look at some of the money as well that's being pumped around for players. What about Rickarlison for forty million? Yeah, I mean, like Jesus Christ, Rickarlison hasn't scored a goal this calendar year. He's got five goals before that. Um, 22 million pounds for Mitrovic, who is, like, bold accounts, yeah, he seems to be, like, a decent championship striker. There's a lot of money being thrown around. And mm. I, you just wonder, like, is it really... Saints maybe just holding holding back a little bit. What about Jorginho from Napoli? I'd have taken Jorginho. Yeah. At 57 million pounds. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, I mean, actually, when we're looking enviously at the big boys, but in terms of the teams that we would expect to be battling with and jostling for position with, I don't know if we have necessarily missed a trick. I, I'd be interested to know what you think, because um, I imagine you had someone in mind when you asked us that question. I think, so, I think the only one that we missed was, hmm. was that because it seems to be the one we were in for, was Madison yeah. from Norwich. Um, Where he chose to go to Leicester. Instead. He chose to go to Leicester instead, and... Uh, yeah, I think we kind of we signed Armstrong, so we've kind of got that kind of scheming midfield player. But Madison is the sort of player you'd have thought come Saints, young English player. Yeah. Um, that's the, that was the only real disappointing one, really. Yeah. What about Quincy Promise? What happened there? We were all told it was a done deal. Did you? Was that just... Uh, Didn't he get nicked for know, hitting his wife or something in Ibiza? Did he? That's what I was told. It's unsubstantiated and not true allegation. <laughs> like, it may have just libelled uh, Quincy Promes. Uh, yeah, I think I think the problem with Promes was that he um, he quickly dropped off our radar when um, was Saint, it? Is it um, was it Saint Petersburg? Yeah, Zen at Saint Petersburg. Yeah, yeah. Once they started asking money that only Everton would pay for players. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Everton. What's going on there? 40 million for Richardson. Jesus Christ. Well, they're owned by Arsenal, aren't they? That's a bit of controversy <laughs> about that. It's not really legal. Again, allegedly. And can <laughs> or may or may not be proof, but that's just something I saw in a BBC Panorama documentary. Oh, we need to move on, otherwise we're going to have to gonna get, get some lawyers, aren't we? Sued for libel. So, Tadic memories. Oh. The time. So we're going to talk about Dusan Tadic. Can I go first? Go for it. I my favourite Dusan moment was the goal against West Ham, where he was put through one on one and he did a step over, and the West Ham it was Adri- Adrian, um, like just fell backwards because he just didn't expect it. So it just totally blew Adrian's mind, and he just kind of rolled it into an empty net, and it was just this lovely moment of of like that's why. That's why they're so skilled, you know, they're so mm. clever in the very moment that it matters. And he just, 
It's a great goal. It's a, and I think we won 3-0 that day. It's a really good day to be a yeah. Saints fan. James? I mean, I'm not going to pick a specific point, but just a general feeling we got, I got from when, watching him play when we had, um, when we had Sadio Mane, Graziani Pella, and Shane Long when Shane Long was scoring goals. And we'd get the ball in our box and then you'd clear it and you'd, everyone would jump up on out of their seat because they expected something to happen because we mm. had three, four players breaking aggressively against a, a nervy defence. And um, so, I mean, I think he was pretty instrumental in our 8-0 win against Sunderland, which I think we've got to consider as a pretty panacea moment for Southampton. But my favourite... One of my favourite Tadic moments is actually that goal he scored against Manchester United, which was oh, exceptional yeah. to win. in terms of um, skill. I mean, decent Tadic was great at skill. I mean, like, I mean, the goal he scored against West Brom last season I thought was really sexy. The goal against West uh, Everton at St Mary's was, was really nice as well. But that goal against Manchester United, which I think was our first win at Old Trafford since the days of Matt Letizia banging goals regularly, I mean, that was just... That was just wonderful. That was like an instinctive... Uh, came back off the post, didn't he? Just low and hard into the middle of the net. And then he lost it. Lost his rag. One of... Got a yellow card. Yeah. Anyway. He loved that. He was yeah. very, very ripped, wasn't he? In so, a strange way. I mean, but, but generally... I, I mean, Decent Tadic goes out the door, I think, with his head held high. He proved that he could do it at the Premier League level. Um... I think most Saints fans will remember him fondly, mainly because the way he left, yeah, was, um, wasn't petulant. Well, he kept he he stepped up when it really mattered. Yeah. He's probably the first player since Sariki Lambert to leave uh, with his kind of head held high. Mm. You know, I I I think. Yeah, Sariki Lambert. Absolutely. Hopefully. Yeah. Deservedly so. Her Majesty, get get him on the list. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah there we go decent Tadic I'm, I'm sorry to see him go see him go 15 million quid is what we're getting he's going to Ajax I mean I can see why go to Ajax bit of fun relatively easy league yeah. Champions League football year in year out yeah I decent mean, money he was, he was a big name when we signed him out of that league right, he was a big name in that league when mm. we signed him out of the league so you can see how Ajax are playing him as a Big transfer and showing that they're still big boys on the block. Yeah. Um, Decent Tadic does have his detractors, though. I mean, I've heard... I think when we first signed Decent Tadic and Graziano Pella, it almost seemed too good to be true. Oh, it was amazing, wasn't it? They just Everything they touched turned to goals. Yeah. And it kind of was, but actually it kind of wasn't. Because you look at those three seasons in a row in the Premier League where we had 8th, 7th and 6th. I mean, the 8th eight, the was under Pellegrino and we thought it's not going to get any better. And then we s- sold... Pochettino? Yeah, sorry, Pochettino, Pochettino. not Pellegrino. Yeah. Um, and then we had, yeah, Decent Tadic and, and Graziano. And, and even under Claude Puel, he still had his moments. And even under Pellegrino, he still had his moments. And I think in terms of a talented player, we probably haven't had in like the terms of skill level probably since Adam Lallana well, he, he um, drove which was he was brought in to replace wasn't he well he drove Saints fans mad didn't he if you you know if you were at the games and you you heard the amount of effing and blinding directed at him and I think that's because he was always trying to do something he was always trying to find a pass find a shot do something special he was always trying to hurt the opposition he didn't really often try and do the simple thing mm. and you know, there are very few players that when they try and do the difficult thing always or mostly get it right. And, uh, you know, the, the football is difficult because you shouldn't come down to statistics. But when you look at Saints, most influential players at the attacking side of the pitch over the last three years or so, um, he is arguably the one that stands out in terms of assists and goals scored. I mean, I've heard Duncan Alexander talking about this before, but quite often the most creative players and the players that are trying the difficult things do have the worst statistics in terms of giving the ball away. I mean, Alex Sanchez, Alexis Sanchez at Arsenal had the worst stats for giving the ball away, but 
you look at the time he spent at Arsenal, apart from the for the last half of the season that he was there, he was he was so threatening. And uh, I have heard other players, I can't remember who it was, described Tadic as the player that opposition teams feared most in the Saints squad. So, and that's what Mark Hughes said about him yeah. as well. Yeah, so so I think he's going to be a big loss. But hopefully one of our new signings is going to be that player that the other players fear. So, I've got a note here. Do we want to talk about pre-season? I don't see the point. I mean, like, the signings are what matters. The training is what matters, which we don't get to see. Yeah. Um, Tour of China. Tour of China. I did see a rumour. Did you see that rumour that the Tour of China was a disaster? And that the, everyone hated the hotels, they hated the games, they hated the pitches they trained on, and the players just spent all the time drinking. It's a rumour I've read. Uh, any truth in that, anyone get in touch. Yeah, I mean, my lack of interest in pre-season, considering we had the World Cup, and then it went <laughs> straight into the Tour de France, where Geraint Thomas was doing so well. I, I've got to admit, I didn't spend an awful lot of time looking at the Saints tour in China. Well, I, I did kind of try and look, watch one of the streams, but it was so bad, it was impossible, and I, I gave up. But you can't really read much into pre-season, but probably the, the most important thing is that you've got decent facilities and the players are getting back to fitness. So if they've got rubbish facilities and the players are drinking, that might not be great news. But that's just that's a rumour from the yeah. China. I mean, who knows? Um but yeah, what really matters is the time they put in back at home, obviously. Yeah. And yeah. Do you think uh, fans are right to have had a total meltdown after the three 0 loss to Derby County in pre season? Um, I mean potentially, but like, you think if you looked at those games, you think we played Schalke so early on the season, can't read much into it. And Derby came in at about what three three weeks into mm. pre-season training, so you'd expect the players to be getting back up to match fitness. You'd expect, and you'd expect Derby to put up put up a good good match against us, and you know conceding three against a Championship side. If it was if it was in the League Cup in mm. a few weeks' time, we'd be yeah you know throwing throwing all of the toys out of the pram. And probably in the two pre-season games that we've got coming up this week, Celta Vigo and is it Bruce who mentioned about that? As well? yeah. yeah. Yeah, the return of Sofiane Buffel, like Mark Hughes tried to see the end of him. And oh, yeah. He just comes straight back, back yeah. like a boomerang. Do you like think a, there's a stadium ban for Buffel? Like a bad boomerang. All right, let's get on to your tweets then, listeners. So, Muckers, Red Saints 76. He says, I think we'll finish 7th, 8th, maybe another cup run to get us excited. But bizarrely, he says, we'll think this is a good season, despite achieving exactly the same the season before last, um, which was obviously the season under Well, Also, I wonder if season ticket sales will be down to you. Yes. You think season ticket sales are down? I think they probably are, yeah. I wonder if the Claude Puel effect might have been worse in terms of season ticket sales than the... I mean, possibly last season because possibly actually nearly getting relegated and surviving is more exciting than <laughs> apparently finishing eighth when your season peaked and you sure? I mean, peaked I, to Anfield in what January? I think I was seeking anger management help from about October onwards. Yeah. I, I mean, I know of at least one Saints fan that's not renewed their season ticket and one Saints fan that has renewed their season ticket as kind of as a result of the end of last season. So maybe it balances itself out. Um, I mean, I'd be delighted with seventh or eighth in a cup oh, run. That would be incredible. I mean, that would yeah, be, that'd be great. you know, you, we'd all take that now. You, yeah. You'd snap your hand off. Which is funny because we all weren't so delighted with it after Quell had achieved it. But, you know, I think last season was perhaps a reality check. Yeah, the league the league is, is so strong. Mm. Looking like Wolves. You know, Wolves have come up, players have signed, the squad they had initially, and then they've signed really, really good players. Um the idea that, you know, we learned this last year, and I think if you listen back to the first show, mm. the preview show, I probably said that, like, the the promoted teams are going to get hammered week mm. in, week out. Brighton and Huddersfield don't have a hope in hell. Um, showed us. And, you know, again, the, the promoted teams, maybe Cardiff aside, look very, very strong. Yeah. Uh, Jamie Pragnall, Jamie underscore Pragnall on Twitter, um, says, will this be, <laughs> I think we asked this question, Last summer as well. Will this be a make or break season for James Ward-Prowse? 
It's that time he reached his potential in the Saints FC shirt. What are your opinions? Um, how old is he still? He's only like 23, Eight. 24. <laughs> he started so young, so it like he seems a lot older than he actually it's is. It's so misleading, isn't it? He's only 23 years old. He's yeah. only 23. I mean, I still thought I, I still had a really far outside shot of being a professional footballer when I was 28, so... In, in in dreams, like literal dreams. Yeah, but I um, don't think that's a real. <laughs> at thirty one, I'm, I'm I'm happily in retirement <laughs> with yeah. my dreams. Looking forward to management in my dreams instead. Um, but I think I think he's I think he's got time. Yeah, I think he's good, and I think he he's like he's he's missing a little bit in his game. Um, he's definitely got a great ball. He's got a great free kick. And um, and maybe just missing a little bit of solidity in tackling and being able to keep the ball um, and distribute it a bit better. But I think he's I think he's really good, and I think we will see him improve. I think we saw him improve last season, mm. and yeah, another season, another couple of seasons. My, Three seasons time, he might be playing for maybe England. Maybe he's going to peak at like thirty six or something, and we've still got another twelve years before it happens. I think our kids will be doing this podcast and they will say, is this James, James Will Prowse season? Um, I love James Will Prowse. I just, again, I've said it loads of times before. I just don't know what he is. Yeah. I don't, he's not a winger. He's not a centre midfielder in the sort of tackling back sense. He lacks a sort of pace. He can't, he doesn't beat people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I just don't know what he is. Like, and I think it's a genuine... It's not me being facetious or trying to like wind anyone up. I just don't know. Like in the modern, you know, he's clearly got incredible talent at set pieces, but he's also incredibly frustrating. So I, I'm going to push you for an answer. Is it going to be a make or break season? Basically, you're saying no. He's just going to continue in the middle. He's neither. Going I guess it kind of, but it, it kind of has to be. But if we're going to play a five-three-two, which everything looks like we're going to, is he going to be ahead of Lamina Romeo? Armstrong, um, oh, yeah, whoever else we got. We only need to see your players. One of the yeah, one of the wingers. You'd yeah. think off the. I don't know. Like it's, it's, I just don't see him. I can't see him in that team. And I would love to because I do think we look better with him on the pitch. Do you think he's going to be the perpetual Southampton substitute? He's going to grind out a career of, I mean, a long career with lots like four hundred odd appearances lots and lots of appearances without ever being the first name on the team sheet type player. I I would love him to be, but I just can't see him yeah. breaking into that team. I think if we played like a, like a, the only thing I thought is, could he one day become like a right wing back? And maybe that's the plan. I right. don't know. We're going to pick up the pace now. Neil Langridge. Is this the chance Mark Hughes will seize to play progressive, exciting football at a club that has given him the ideal opportunity or will he revert to his stayed safe type and get us a solid tenth with minimal fun? Um, I mean, I think I think the performances that he gave us at the end of last season were were quite good. Like the motivate the players were obviously motivated. If, and if he can keep that tempo up, I think we'll do a lot better than we did in those games because we won't have this massive looming panic of we might get relegated. Mm. And so I think that would feed, I think if you looked at some of the games where we took leads and then we lost them, like Chelsea, yeah. Everton, um, I think we'll, I think we'd be able to close those games out this time. I agree. And cause, cause they won't be panicking. And so hopefully, hopefully, yeah, I think, I mean, hopefully it's 10th without a fuss. Yeah. I agree. I think, I think we'll see, we'll see smarter football this year. Yeah. I mean, Lucy Heiner kind of says to um, to Neil here, you're, you're making tents sound a lot easier than I expect it to be. Um, but Richard Harrison saying solidity at the back, creative in midfield and out wide, potency up front. I think we could be battling for a European place once again. Is that a little bit optimistic? Well, what, top seven get Europe? I don't know if the potency up front has necessarily been solved yet. Yeah. There's this Lamborghini. If this climate change continues, will it spell the end <laughs> of the bobble hat? Um, I hope not. 
I've been looking at this. So, I mean, I work in sustainability as a profession. So we do a little bit of climate modelling and climate adaptation. We think about how we're going to adapt the, the buildings that we manage for the, the future climate. Um, the chances are we're going to have more extremes of weather. So, it, and, and in fact, if the, um, if the jet stream which brings us our temperate climate um, goes awry, we'll, we'll actually probably see more extremes in the summer and more extremes in the winter. So then may, you may even find that there's a good few extra months of bobble hat wear in the winter. <laughs> so are you saying buy shares in bobble hat makers? Well, Is that your advice? I mean, my Start advice knitting really your bobble hats. would actually be to invest in renewable energy, <laughs> um, get rid of politicians that uh, sit in the cabinet and are linked to the companies like Shell and Esso, and then give you lukewarm renewable policies um, as a way of disguising the fact that they actually want the whole sector to, to, to die because they've got financial invested interest in it. But where do you stand on bobble hats, John? Bobble hats, I think, are good. I think, you know, they're, they're nice. And I think regardless of whether we solve the problem of climate change or not, there's a future in bobble hats. So you're it's okay. Nice. I invested all my kids' uh, savings in bobble hats, so that's good to know. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so Leslie Lamborghini also says, will we sign that last uh, forward-thinking player? Um, and how fine actually is Stuart Armstrong's hair? Well, I think we've already answered that it's one. bloody good. Um, forward-thinking player? I mean, let's hope so. Um, Saint Segi actually replied to Les's Lamborghini and she says, defo not in terms of the end of the bobble hats. I think she's right. She's also done her research on climate change adaptation. Um, two, will we sign that forward thinking player? No. So she doesn't you know, expect us to sign a striker. And three, loves the hair, as everyone seems to with, with Stuart Armstrong. Shirley Mush, um, great blogger on Southampton. Do look up uh, his blog pieces. They're really kind of quite thoughtful. The question I've been thinking a lot about is WTF is going on with Kruger's um, and Southampton's approach. Um, so Southampton's approach has changed quite a lot since he arrived. Yet so far this summer, um, the strategy he strongly applied would be adopted hasn't materialised. So I think he's talking about Kruger's interview where he said the Southampton way, which we thought was about bringing players through from youth and getting into the first team, was actually about bringing players from abroad and selling them to the big clubs. I mean, is Kruger just confused and caught in the headlights when he does interviews? Because he's done a You'd few, hope they've not. all been quite confusing, haven't they? Yeah. I mean, you think not, because, you know, John, your job is much more important than my sustainability. My job is um, corporate PR. So you'd think he would go and sit in an interview and not know what he's going to talk about and not know the kind of three or four points he really wants to get across. I don't know. Maybe we are going to see. Maybe some of this transfer in action is a sign that the Silence Way is going to come back. We spoke about last season loads about Josh Sims. Maybe the reason why we've not signed uh, a right-sided winger uh, which we you know we realise we will need uh, is because we're going to play Josh Sims. Yeah. Uh, Josh Sims is, is you know I think he's one of our most exciting players. Maybe the reason why we're not signed a second right back to cover uh, Suarez is because Harrison Reed's going to come back. Harrison Reed played right back, yeah. um, uh, you know, for Norwich last year. Maybe that's the reason why. Maybe the reason we're not signed a forward is because Gallagher's going to get some game time. We don't quite know anything right now. Yeah. And I think Kruger's comments haven't really cleared anything up, have they? And the way that Southampton... I mean, to be honest, I mean, Kruger made those comments about flogging players to the Big Six at a time when we had no players left <laughs> that the Big Six would be remotely interested in. So, um, yeah, interesting comments. Maybe, maybe he was shopping around to get some extra money. Uh, I, I do think he just stepped... He does seem to have this thing of when we're in crisis, he'll step out and do an interview for the local news where he basically just goes... Everything's fine. Yeah. Calm down and people ignore him. So here's a quick quick fire question. Who scores the most goals out of Elianusi, Armstrong or Vestergaard? Out of those three? Yeah. Elianusi. Yeah, I gotta agree. He's gonna punish people. I'm gonna go Vestergaard. I love Seven Vestergaard. He's gonna have a song, isn't he? It's gonna be so good. Yeah. Let, let's put this out to the listeners at Saints of Sea Podcast or Saints of Sea Podcast at gmail.com what are going to be the songs that we'll have for those three they're all quite I'd love to see anyone who can rhyme El Hanusi with anything <laughs> um, Pravel Kakural has said I thought Saints were going to be relegated last season especially after the Palace game but fair play they proved me wrong uh, which is obviously what I wanted um, 
But will I be a negative person again? If I think the priority this season should be survival first, because that the Premier that's the Premier League. As anyone outside the top six could get into a relegation battle and the manager changes situations. I mean, can, can we hope for better than survival? I, I'd hope that we could. You'd be... Well, I think all teams probably aim for survival first. It's kind of obvious. And I don't see that we'll do anything different. At the end of the day, they're going to go out there and want to win every single game. Yeah. That's just what they should be trying to do, and that's what they absolutely will try and do, whether it's Man City away or Cardiff at home. They're going to try and win every single game. To be honest, I, I think what I'd love to see is Saints make a really solid start, get going, and be in the position where the players are playing with confidence, and they can actually take a little bit more of a risk in terms of our youth players and bring in, you know, bring some more of them into the squad more regularly, and the manager to not feel that, like, impending sense of doom and pressure to, to just stick with yeah. the old, old players. But we've got, again, you know, we had this last season, we didn't capitalise on it. We've got a relatively soft start to the season. Burnley at home, Everton away, Leicester at home, Palace away, Brighton at home. Yeah. Like, those are games we should be looking to take points three from. points from probably every single one of those. Maybe, you know, you get you take a draw at Everton away. So, there's no reason, you know, we should be kicking the, we should be kicking on um, because we need to, like, we don't want to be doing what we did last season where we didn't take the opportunity to take points and then all of a sudden we're in yeah. doggy doo Yeah. Okay. Um, which player to look out for this season? James. Alianisi. Tom. Armstrong. Me. Ben Nurek. Oh, you love Ben Ray, don't you? I, he's, he's become my... Cult dream hero, yeah. Player. Only in the last kind of like few months. He's got such good hair. You would have thought after that game that we... Did all three of us go down to watch that game? Oh, you, you went to Wolves. Who yeah. would have thought that Ben Rick, that day would be a player who would go to the World Cup... Score. Score a goal and get a man of the match. Okay, admittedly it was in a game which didn't mean an awful lot of Poland because they'd already been knocked out, but... Still counts. He also scored a goal against, was it Tottenham Hotspur? Chelsea. Chelsea. The heartbreak um, game. And he looked really brilliant for the last half of the season. Right? And I wouldn't be surprised if Benrek, who was bottom of the pecking order in terms of defenders, foreign guard us aside, um, maybe starts the season closer to the top. So our three centre-backs, in your view, would be? Benrek. Best guard, I think probably after the World Cup he had Shida. Shida. I think Wesley Hoot and Jack Stevens have some catching up to do. I mean, I'd I'd kind of like to see. I mean, Best guard and Hoyt is a is mm. a big centre back pairing, but Hoyt's useless in the air, so it doesn't make any difference anyway. Yeah. yeah, I think I think I'd expect those three to be the ones that line up against Burnley. So there we go. Um, and the Burnley game are interesting because they've already played Europe. They're going to play Europa League games. So are we going to get a tired Burnley or are we going to get a much more match fit Probably than Saints Burnley? Burnley. Burnley. Yeah, I so that's quite interesting. Seriously, aren't they? Yeah, that's an, it's an interesting, difficult one to start the season with. Um, who do you think will be Southampton's player of the season? Last year you predicted it would be Oriel Romeo. Who was our player of the season this season? I did we Stuart even... Armstrong. Our player of the season yeah. was Hoiberg, I think. Was it Hoiberg? Yeah. It wasn't a standout. I can't believe None it. of them really did well. I think well. on the back of it. He actually looked like he cared every single game. Yeah, and he did that. It was at the interview after the Newcastle game where he looked really emotional. Yeah. Yeah, we liked that. We chose um, player of the season last season as Pierre Emil Hoiberg for the Saints FC podcast. Um, but Alex McCarthy, Pierre Emil Hoiberg and Tadic were the nominees that we had. But going back to our point about James Ward-Prowse there, if you think about us playing 5-3-2 and therefore our full-backs being the wingers mm. and that's for us needing midfielders that can hold yeah. the ball, pierre Mill Hoiberg. Yeah. You know, like, fantastic in that role. So... So what, what I mean is, like, that's not... Again, it, our, our formation doesn't lend itself to Ward Prowse. No. So how, who was your prediction? For the player of the season this year? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go Vestergaard. Vestergaard. Because I just think, love him. 
I think um, Charlie Austin's going to get played by the manager and therefore he's going to score 14, 15 goals and get on that player of the season. He loves scoring goals. Oh, yeah. And he, he loves playing matches, which Pellegrino really didn't like him doing. <laughs> <laughs> Stop playing those matches, Charlie. Um, this is, you know, it's, it's a tough one. I'm going to go for Gabbiadini. It's total... Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I realise that's a total wild card. And the purists. On that. But wouldn't that be great? If it, Gabbiadini is our player of the season, it probably means we've had a pretty wonderful yeah. season, I think. Yeah. He looks like an extra from Assassin's Creed. Um, I'm a big Gabbiadini fan. He's just a fox in the box. Yeah. I mean, you could see it with Oyanusi's little ding, dinks over the top through balls that... Um, that might really play into Gabbiadini really well because Gabbiadini loves to chase the ball and they don't really, like, we weren't really giving him that service last season. And it's funny though, sorry, because we talked about the lack of forwards we have. Mm. We've got an Italian international. Yeah. Yeah. Who didn't play in the World Cup because Italy didn't get in the World yeah. Cup. Um, but kudos to him this summer. You know, his, um, his, he kept on telling his agent to go back out to the press and say, I don't want to move to Bologna or any other club in Italy. Yeah. Let me play in the Premier League. I mean, it, I think what that tells you is the fact that Bertrand stayed, the fact that Cedric has stayed mm. so far, the fact that Gabbiadini is still here. Um, to date, as we're recording, Lamina is still here as well. It does tell you that I think the players are a little bit more bought into the manager. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think you can imagine the meltdown if any of those four are gone. Yeah. I mean, I think if Pellegrino was still here, we would have. Well. If, if Pellegrini was still here and we'd somehow managed to stay in the Premier League, we would have seen a total exodus of players, I'm sure of it. Yes. And this would have been a very, very sad Demoral. podcast. <laughs> um, youth player to establish themselves in the first team. James Ward-Prowse. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to go with Josh, Josh Sims. Josh Sims is who we chose last year. Oh, I love yes. Josh Sims. It was injury, really, that prevented him from yeah. making that step up but he is so direct he's exciting to watch I he think. is exciting to watch. I mean what's interesting uh, someone like Jan Valery is in the first two squad who people who watch sort of um, the reserve teams of Saints and the, and the youth teams of Saints have spoken about in sort of hushed terms about yeah. when it comes to the talent he's got um, and we do you know we've got one right back that's true you know so and he's 19 um, by all accounts, the kid has got acres of talent. So, so what about kind of like, uh, are we going to see anything from Upper Femi? We saw about fifteen minutes from last season, which I quite enjoyed. You just can't imagine him getting on the pitch, can you? I mean, like, if you think all the, if you think the things that have to happen for Upper Femi to get on the pitch, so Charlie Austin has to be injured, be injured, not unlikely. Shane Long has to be rubbish, not unlikely. Gabby Dean has to be out of favour, not unlikely. You know, <laughs> maybe it's a, oh my god, he has to be loaned out to Birmingham City, yeah, which is highly likely. Yeah. You know, well, so yeah, God, he's going to start every game. Yeah, I mean, the other player that I'd like to see get a few games is is Jake Heskin. Oh I like, god, I saw yeah. Him a couple of seasons ago against Palace in the League Cup, and he just tore through that Palace team just with just by like he just the second he gave him the ball, he'd pass it on to the striker and. And it's just that quick movement is was really worked for us well, in that game. What about Sam McQueen? I, I guess mean, it depends if one of if Bertrand or Cedric leave, then he's quite useful yeah. in the wing back position. Yeah, I think him and Target really have to Target's get a, get a solid injury mm. to get themselves a good season. I think Target will happily and relatively successfully step Can we say Bertrand's anything team. for Jace Jeez. Flanagan, Alfie James, Will Woods? Can't see Will, you know. I, th I think you have to be realistic. I think that um, one of you, the young Valley, I'd love uh, Heska to get a chance. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know. The challenge is the league is just so good and the players are so big and they're so strong that for a young player to come through, you've got to be really special now. Yeah. I mean, it Looking at the Saints squad, there's 71 players listed, I think. No, well, uh, no, there's 71 numbers in the squad. Numbers. But there's a hell of a lot of players. Yeah. I mean, uh, 
so that's all the players that could potentially be senior players and I mean we still obviously have like a massive youth development program but we've, we've got to see some of these players start to come through now haven't we? yeah they've got to shape up or ship out and that's um, that's sad but let, we've got a really strong solid squad yeah. Uh, and I, I hope that the reason why we're not seeing some signings is because we're going to get some some young players come yeah. through. Okay. Um, get ready for your predictions. So I'm going to read one more tweet from uh, one of our listeners. But whilst I read that tweet and we think about the answer for that, I also want you to, in the back of your head, to come up with your prediction for the position that Southampton are going to finish in this season. Southampton's top goal scorer and... Also, the Premier League's top goal scorer. Your top four of the Premier League and your bottom three. And your cult hero, although I think Tom's already answered that one. So, but whilst you think about that, Aaron Collum uh, tweets in and says, Are you feeling hope? And if we're honest about our acquisitions, have we really done the business to solve our goals problem? But... What I really liked about this tweet and why I left it for last was, are you feeling hope at the start of this season? Poor hope. Uh, I, 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 th- I feel optimistic at the start of every season. Um, why can't you? you, know, if you, if you can't, this is the most optimistic you can be for the entire season. Is this the best part of the season? This is the best bit. I mean, it certainly is for Liverpool fans, isn't it? You should put us in a box now until this time next year. But if you can't feel optimistic now and you can't feel excited now, mm. then maybe you need to find another hobby. Because there's nothing to make you feel negative. Certainly right now. If we don't have hope, what do we have, Tom? Despair. Okay. James, do you have hope? (laughs) Yes, I have hope. Okay. Hope square, hope cubed. I I always have hope. You know what? And it's it's actually the times when you're heading down to St. Mary's. And there's been a few occasions where I've been heading down to St. Mary's and I've felt like actually... I don't have hope. I'm not looking forward to this. I don't have the buzz that you get from a match day. And it's very, very, very rare that you get that feeling. So I, I still have hope. Yeah, and we've got it. We, we, you know, the positivity will feed into mm. the players. Uh, and we need to be positive because we need to give the players everything they can. In terms of your second question, I don't think we've necessarily solved the goals problem because, as we just discussed there, it is quite likely that Austin could get injured. It is quite likely that Gabbiadini could go off the board. It's quite likely that Sam Gallagher is going to be loaned out. Do we have another striker? Oh, yeah, Shane Long. Gone. Yeah, and Shane Long, wow. Yeah. I mean, the... Runs a lot, doesn't he? The... <laughs> I, I love Shane Long, but, but I don't know if we're going to get another double-figure season out of him. You sort of expect us to buy a striker if we just mm. shipped out... Our, I mean, okay, he's... He is our record transfer striker, but he's probably the fourth in the packing order by now um so yeah i mean if we ship one out we'd assume we bring one in really yeah so predictions for the season let's start with a big one where are saints going to finish this season 11th i think we'll finish a uh, solid ninth Ooh. a solid ninth is what tom predicted last season I predicted seventh. Last you were so last optimistic. Year. I was John. So wrong. I mean, you can see, Aaron, that my hope shouldn't be uh, taken with a serious helping of salt and pepper and various other things to, to season it. I'm, I'm going to go tenth, which means that we've all put a slap bang in the middle of the table, haven't we? Between ninth and eleventh. Yeah, but remember, like the difference between seventeenth and tenth is usually only like six or seven points, mm. and. I think you look at last season, even in those performances, we, we should have really got another six or seven points. Yeah. I agree. Um, top goal scorer? Charlie Austin's red and white. Same hip. He hates Pompey. <laughs> he really does. He doesn't. Um, <laughs> he loves horses as well. Gosh. Let's, let, I mean, if Charlie Austin gets... 20 games, 24 games, he's going to be our top goal scorer, isn't he? He'll get a goal every two games. If he plays, he gets goals. Like, I mean, he's, he scored, I mean, that's what he does. You know, he doesn't yeah. do much else, but that's fine. We're totally fine with that. Gary Lineker didn't do much else. He just scores goals. Yeah. Um, so Charlie Austin it is. Uh, Premier League top goal scorer? 
Here's an interesting comment. So who was the top goal scorer last season? Harry Kane. Lukaku. And by the way, for those of you listening to the podcast, I'm shaking my head as the answer's <laughs> coming. That's Tom. Mohamed Salah, wasn't it? Of course oh, it was. Course it was. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, what comment did you say about Mohamed Salah at this point last season? He said he's inconsistent, John. <laughs> well... Let's hope so. He's going to have a stinker <laughs> of a season this season. I mean, you know, he did have one game where he didn't score, so that does count as inconsistent. Yeah. I think I'm sticking by my guns on this. Um, can we see pass Salah for the top goal scorer this season? I'd be amazed if it's... like I, I can't see anyone but like even beating Man City this mm. year. So I'd be amazed. like Even like someone like Aguero. Again. It's getting on a yeah. bit. Isn't it? I yeah, think it's just a goal machine. Yeah, but there's four players really: there's Salah, Lukaku, Kane, and Aguero. And so you'd assume it would come from one of those four. I think Harry Kane's going to do it. I, I'd hope it's Harry Kane because I like as long as he doesn't score against us, which he obviously will do. Yeah, because uh, I love him a lot. Top four Premier League. I'm going to go Man City at the top. Again, retaining the title doesn't often happen. No, I'm going to go uh, Liverpool second. Spurs third, uh, and then um, I'm gonna yeah, Spurs third, and then probably Arsenal fourth. Back to their uh, back to their right forward position with, with Arsenal. So what you're saying is Chelsea gonna miss out? Yeah, I just I don't know. They've not signed. I mean, they're looking at losing a lot of their players, aren't they? And obviously they will sign other players, but there does seem to be a lot of discontent around that football club. Again, they've binned off a manager. It just seems weird. They're talking about losing the goalkeeper, losing Azard, struggling to keep Kante. Mm-hmm. Morata might be off. Uh, a lot of negativity around Chelsea. Do you think um, some of the big spenders, Everton, West Ham, could get up there? Do you think Leicester could rekindle their form, break into the top four? Definitely no on Leicester. Right. Everton just. I, I don't get it. Forty million on Richardson. Yeah, you also left out Manchester United. Are you thinking Mourinho's going to be no hope? Really? I think Mourinho's be fired. Yeah, I think Mourinho's doing that thing that Mourinho does to set himself up to be fired. You know, where he moans about everything and blames everyone else, and then he gets fired and he gets two years' money. Yeah, that's what he's doing. Yeah, I'll put that past him. So James, top, top four. I'm gonna go with. Um, let's see. Arsenal, Arsenal fourth. I was going to say Arsenal. No, oh, Arsenal champions. fourth. You are brave. <laughs> hey, wait, wait. I've got a good one, though. Man United third, Man City second, and I'm going to go throw the boat out. Um, it'll probably sink. Liverpool to win the league. I think Van Dijk <laughs> is going to plug that massive hole in the Liverpool defence. I, I, I would like... I didn't say I wanted it to happen. I'm just saying that's what I think might happen. Okay. I am going to go Manchester City, Manchester United, Tottenham Hotspur, Chelsea. So no Liverpool even in the top four? I think it's going to be hilarious. Is that because you don't want Liverpool to be there or you don't think they're going to be there? Um... I think that you're onto something when you said Mohamed Salah was inconsistent last year, and I think this season they'll all be scratching their heads um, as to why it's not worked out. Okay, so bottom three now. Who's going to be the victim? You can't see. Well, I said this last year. Can't you see past can't see past Huddersfield. Right? No, definitely not. You can't see past Cardiff. Cardiff City. Cardiff City. Lovely. City, lovely, you know, lovely people, but you just can't see them staying up. Uh, I think Watford are going to struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, then, I, you know, I genuinely don't know. I mean, I, I, Fulham have signed some good players, but I, don't, I just don't, can't. Like, none of the, you know, Mitrovic is their big striker. You need someone in Premier League who's going to score your goals. Mitrovic is not a Premier League goal scorer. Mm. I'll be proved wrong probably, but so yeah, for me, like Cardiff, like, Watford, Fulham. Oh, don't <laughs> we? You know, we'd have and we'd have Watch killed. Gentlemen, get Mitrovic in your yeah. fantasy Premier League side. And the funny thing is, as Saints fans, we'd have killed for Glenn Murray, wouldn't we, last season? James, I mean, Cardiff, yeah, are going to provide a lot of entertainment with Neil Warnock. 
it'll be great to see him back doing post-match interviews. There's a great video of him um, of him after we beat the... Did we beat them at Leeds? We beat them at Leeds, didn't we? With Nigel Atkins when we got promoted. And there is a great cl- sound bite where they shake hands and, um, and Neil Warnock says something that shouldn't be repeated on this podcast, but it's worth looking it up on YouTube. Okay. And um, so I think they're going to come last. I, um, I think Fulham... I mean, we we played them when we were probably at our weakest and still did, they didn't really put that much pressure on us. Um, and and then the other one I think is definitely going to be Huddersfield because I think they got they got very lucky and I think they'll be completely found out. This next Ooh, season. Huddersfield's an interesting one. I, I think it's going to be Cardiff, Huddersfield and Brighton. I think Huddersfield and Brighton had a bit of momentum I think they're going to suffer from second season syndrome triple S um, again Cardiff Neil Warnock is kind of cursed isn't he in the Premier League he can't quite do it interestingly I think Wolverhampton Wanderers out of the promoter side will get slots straight into the top half of the table they signed quality players yeah and they had and they had really yeah, good players serious yeah serious prospects as well the only thing with Wolves is I think they might I just feel they might have like something I don't know that you expect they've signed all these flair players and that mm. they might get found out in defence or something like that. Cult hero? Best of God. James. I think um no I'm gonna go for the, the hair. Um Armstrong. Armstrong. <laughs> I'm gonna go for get the Adini again. Next fixtures we've got Burnley Home, Everton Away. <sighs> Car Saints. Burnley home, first day of the season. They're already a little bit warmed up, had a bit of European practice. I think we're going to win. I said this. We never never win at the start. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. This is a new era. I think we're going to win. I think it's going to be tight. I think we're going to win 1-0. I think it's going to be Charlie Austin. James? I think um, I'm going to go with a crazy 3-1 to Southampton. That's insane. But we've, we've beaten them before. That, by that margin so we can do it again I'm going to say that Fraser Forster is going to complete a loan over to um, Burnley and he's going to pull off the performance that we saw when Saints drew with Arsenal we're not going there's going to be a clause in that yeah but surely yeah, they're not normally allowed are they yeah, yeah they are allowed to play against their they're not yeah but I think most of the loanee clubs don't allow okay, it okay okay alright well I'll go for a score draw then well, I mean Tom Heaton's no mug so yeah. either way you're going to face a decent keeper and Everton away are we finally going to win there? No. No, no. You'd take that, wouldn't you? So, first two games of the season. We'll be joint second. Joint four, second points. With four points. Four points. Yeah, with, with like seven or eight other teams. I'm say <laughs> joint 12th with two points, I think. Two draws. And then we're going to start to pick up the pace. Well, I, I'm fine with that as well. Okay, anyway, I think we've got to the end of the show unless there's anything else that either of you two feel that you must desperately add before the season starts. No. No, I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> well, well then. Um, ta-ta, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for listening once again. Well done if you've made it this far through to the podcast. There's probably two commutes worth. Uh, yeah, home uh, journey as well as your commuting. Um, if you'd like to get in contact with us, it's at Saints FC Podcast on Twitter. It's Saints FC Podcast at gmail.com. Give us a rating on iTunes. Um, remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcast from and remember to share this far and wide. So it's bye bye from me. It's good night from me. Good night.